So Jonathan Fellis is going to be presenting a uh, presentation called Bird Watching the Easy Way, Tracking Seabirds in the Pacific Ocean. And he can talk about why it's so easy to track birds that way. But Jonathan is actually a, or he, he, he got his degree in environmental geology, but instead of working in the geology field, he's pretty much spent most of his career as a geographer and wildlife biologist for the US Geological Survey, doing survey and other work up and down the West Coast in Alaska, Hawaii, and internationally. So it's been a, um, it's been a little different than environmental geology, but he's, he's been tracking birds instead of rocks. <laughs> so, which I think this sounds more interesting as a more of a bird person myself. So anyway, I'm gonna take, hand it over to uh, Jonathan and I'm really happy to have him here. And he, he's with the, US, I should say, he's with the USGS Western Ecological Research Center, um, but does work remotely. So um, we're luckily, lucky to have him here on our Zoom presentation tonight. And what the way we'll be doing questions tonight, if you can put your questions in the chat or the Q&A function, and I will keep track of those questions. And as we go through the presentation, I will answer those questions. Um, I do want to, I, I do have a, um, one question before we start. I wanted to make sure everybody knows that any, anybody that access our website, the North Cascade Audubon Society can, uh, um, can view those virtual programs or take part in any of our programs. You don't have to be a member of North Cascade Audubon Society. We did, we did have a question about that. So with that, um, Jonathan, why don't you take it away? All right, thanks a lot, Stephen. And um, thanks to North Cascades Audubon and the Walker Museum for coordinating in this. Can, Stephen, can you just confirm that you can hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. All right. Um, Great. Well, um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. And um, as Stephen said, I work with the U.S. Geological Survey. And um, the reason I am here and tied into North Cascades Audubon is that I, I work for an office um, based in California, but I live in Mount Vernon and have for several years now. So um, through a network of you know, friends and colleagues, I got tied into um, uh, giving this presentation for this group. So I'm excited to be here and um, yeah, and just, just, to, um, just to add a few more things about my background um, beyond what Steven said, uh, as he mentioned, I come educationally from a background that was focused on geology, um, but pretty quickly realized that um, I like chasing wild animals around in the outdoors a lot better than chasing rocks around. So uh, uh, led to a kind of change of course and change of career uh, to some extent. Um, and um, now I get to spend my time thinking about primarily seabirds, but um, other wildlife and other aspects of biology as well. And uh, um, you know, the pictures I put up here, um, I, I swear I smile a lot more than, uh, than it looks like in these pictures, but I, I think these are funny examples of uh, instances where, where uh, I've actually been approached by seabirds in particular, but wildlife in general. And you, most of the time, um, most of my life as a wildlife biologist, I've spent um, ch chasing animals around and, you know, being frustrated a lot of the time, not being able to get close to things. And um, these are a couple, couple times in my life where uh, some pretty amazing animals just walked right up to me or landed next to me in situations. So the awkward look on my face is more shock than uh, uh, I'm in a good mood. I'm just more shocked than anything. Um, so, um, and yeah, the program I work for uh, at the U.S. Geological Survey is uh, uh, focuses on seabird research um, along the west coast of the U.S. and around Hawaii. Um, so we work on a variety of projects and um, programs that um, are focused on um, understanding the distribu distribution and abundance of different seabirds um, and how that, in a variety of um, management and conservation contexts. And um, so tonight I'm gonna uh, 
talk about a few examples of that. And uh, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and dive right in. Um, so I just wanted to start off by um, sort of asking the question, why track seabirds at all? Um, and, or why track any animal or wildlife species for that matter? And uh, I think um, this, this map figure that I stole from BirdLife International's website is a great example um, of, of why we would want to track seabirds in particular. Um, and one of the big answers is that seabirds exist in a realm that's really hard for humans to work. Uh, the ocean is a vast and expansive place and it's a very challenging place to access and seabirds spend the vast majority of their life at sea uh, and in places we can't, um, we can't visit. And all these colors and dots all over this map are from BirdLife International has a database of seabird tracking data um, and uh, collected all over the world. And this is all these colors and dots are just um, locations from tracking different animals with different types of tracking tags. Uh, all over the world and all the different ocean basins of the world. And as you can see, um, you know, these areas, there's the amount of information that's just shown in this map is something that uh, it goes far beyond anything that we could really understand from say, trying to do some sort of traditional survey like driving a boat across the Pacific Ocean um, or uh, some, some other traditional type of survey where we just go visually identify things or detect them in other ways. So. I think this is a really impressive uh, figure because it both shows the vastness of the um, habitats and the realms in which we're trying to work and understand these types of animals um, and also shows how much information we can get from tracking animals and fill in these gaps. Um, a little more specifically, uh, you know, what can we learn from tracking seabirds? Uh, what kind of questions can we answer? Um, uh, we can learn about breeding sites. So we can learn for species that are say cryptic or hard to study. Maybe they're nocturnal and nest in hard to access places. Um, we can use tagging and tracking to let them show us, those animals show us where they go to breed, um, especially if it's places we can't go on our own. Um, it can show us where previously unknown nesting areas or nesting sites are um, that might be of conservation importance. Um, we can, at sea, we can learn about important areas um, across the life history of uh, different seabird species. We can learn about important areas for foraging, um, say for breeding seabirds when they're nesting, like where do they need to go to feed um, for themselves and to get food to feed their chicks. Um, we can also learn about important areas during migration, um, such as like stopover sites and wintering areas that are um, important to individuals and species or groups of species. And then beyond just knowing where these animals spend time, we can learn more about um, their behavior at sea. So uh, we can learn about whether they're foraging or not. We can learn about um, if they're flying, where they're flying, how high they're flying, um, and all of these will have, um, I'll talk about these in a little more detail with some examples uh, as I move through the presentation. So um, just to give you a brief outline of where we're going with the rest of the presentation, um, I'm gonna go through a quick overview of a few different types of biologgers or um, basically as a, another word we use for talking about tracking tags. Um, and uh, I'm gonna go over a brief overview of biologgers used to track seabirds. And then I'm going to go through three different examples um, of species or projects that I've worked on in my, uh, during my career. Um, the first will be identifying unknown nesting areas for cryptic species, and that will focus on murrelets in Alaska. Um, the second will uh, be about uh, mapping important at-sea foraging areas um, for marine spatial planning and management. Um, and that will be specifically about Hawaiian seabirds and potential uh, wind energy development around the Hawaiian islands. And the third uh, example will be on um, 
identifying important migratory pathways and stopover sites in the non-breeding season for uh, shearwater species and how that relates to um, some work being done on fisheries interactions um, and conservation issues for those species. And um, I'll just give a quick pause here, Stephen, if there's any questions that have popped up um, before I jump into the examples. Um, I don't have any questions. Um, somebody, somebody is noting that they don't see, we're not seeing maps or pictures yet, but I see them on my screen. So maybe something is wrong with their screen. So whoever asked that question, um, they need to adjust their, you know, work on their screen, I think, because I think people can see the, the presentation okay. Okay. That's not my question. I do have a question. Going back to that map that you showed, um, were the colors different birds? Were the colors different birds or were they um, intensity of bird populations? Uh, on this map, the colors are different um, species of birds from different colonies, and I think. Um, they're not okay. data okay. personally collected, okay. so it's not entirely positive. But it's not an intensity map. It's just each one's basically like a different study or project at a different colony or site on a species. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Okay, that's the only question. I didn't have any other questions. Sure. Okay, well then I'll keep going. Um, and uh, just, I'm gonna quickly go over a few different types of biologgers or tracking devices. And um, this is gonna be some of the primary types that are used and they relate to the examples I'm going to show, but I um, will also just put out there that there's many other types that exist currently, and especially a lot of new technologies that are being developed that I'm not going to talk about tonight. Uh, the first is traditional radio telemetry, or VHF telemetry, and um, this is probably one of the older um, ways in which people have tracked wild animals um, by using a tag attached to an animal that emits a specific uh, a radio signal on a specific frequency and then you the, the user or a biologist can listen for that on a receiver with an antenna to try to hone in on where that animal is there's like an active form of tracking an animal you have to go out and um, specifically listen for that animal and it's over short ranges in the scale of several you know a few miles or maybe a little more depending upon um, a few things and um, so in this example on the right, in the photo, a friend of mine is holding a, a receiver and, a, and, a, and, a, and an antenna that are listening for a bird that's out on the water, um, listen for the radio frequency of a bird that's out on the water. Um, the second, a second example is satellite telemetry. And this involves um, a tag attached to an animal that uh, uh, interacts or, or, or um, communicates with a, um, single satellite from a satellite array um, orbiting over the Earth's surface. And basically it uses the Doppler effect to locate an animal. And um, if everyone's familiar with how a ambulance, how the pitch or frequency of a ambulance siren changes as that ambulance moves away from you, um, this tracking technology uses the same concept where a single satellite just um, is receiving signals from a tag on an animal on the Earth's surface. But as that satellite moves across the Earth's surface, in its orbit and passes the animal, it basically tries to pinpoint based on where the frequency changes, um, where that animal was as it, as it flew over the Earth's surface, as the, as the satellite flew over the Earth's surface. Um, and the third four, uh, type of um, biologic devices I'm gonna talk about tonight are uh, use GPS, uh, which I think um, a lot of us are fairly familiar with these days. It's in basically all of our smartphones and, um, and many other devices that we use in our everyday lives. Um, and GPS uses an array of satellites, um, at least four, uh, to essentially triangulate the position of uh, a tag or an animal on the surface of the earth um, from above. And that information is either store in tag then the location um, and you have to download that data later by getting the tag back um, and in some but in some cases there are tags that can transmit that information either to satellites or to other networks to send it to you remotely um, 
And I should mention with the satellite telemetry example, um, these also send you information on where an animal is remotely. So you sit at your computer and um, after doing the, the work of getting tags deployed on animals in the field, you can you get all the location information back at your computer. Um, so both of the satellite telemetry and the GPS telemetry examples often involve, um, well, the satellite telemetry involves um, getting the data remotely and the GPS telemetry often involves getting the tag back, but can also involve getting the data remotely, depending on the technology. There's many other examples um, that I'm not gonna talk about tonight, but I'll just throw them out there because I think it's cool to, to know about. Um, there's light level loggers that let help with which we can determine the position of um, a tag and an animal on the Earth's surface just based on the time of sunrise and sunset and how long the day is. Um, there's dive loggers that um, measure pressure and you can understand basically you can measure the depth and duration of um, dives of seabirds that dive underwater to catch fish. Um, accelerometry uh, is another technology that's used in a lot of tags now and that's also in a lot of smartphones. In our phones it tells us how many steps we take or how well we sleep. Um, basically looking at how something moves um, in three dimensions and looking for patterns in those in those movements and what how they might relate to behavior. So we can understand if a bird's flapping its wings or if it's gliding just based on a tag like that. Um, and there's also um, tagging technologies that utilize both, uh, radar or um, cellular tower arrays to locate animals. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of different things going on. It's an exciting um, uh, world in terms of technology right now for what it's letting us, the kinds of questions we're able to ask. Um, it's also changing really quickly. So often I find I'm struggling to keep up with uh, everything that's new, latest and greatest. Um, but I'm going to focus on those three examples on the left for the examples I'm going to um, provide tonight. And I'll pause one more time just in case there's any questions on that before I go into the examples. Um, Stephen, if there's anything that's popped up. Yeah, Jonathan, so far we don't have any questions. Okay, great. All right, so the first example that I we'll talk about is um, Merlet nesting biology in Alaska. And um, this is, a, is gonna relate to a project that I worked on um, in the early days of my time working with seabirds. Uh, the first few years I was involved in this field, I worked as a seasonal field technician on a project in um, the Gulf of Alaska, which is kind of what um, turned me on to seaweed research and working on the ocean and around the ocean um, back in the mid 2000s. And specifically, I worked there on a species called the Kitlitz's Merlet. And uh, it's a species that uh, exists primarily in Alaska and to a lesser extent around um, Eastern Russia. Um, and uh, this was a species of conservation concern and was uh, potentially going to be listed by the Fish and Wildlife Service back in the early 2010s. Um, that ultimately didn't happen, but um, some of the, a lot of work went on on the species to understand more about its um, natural history and biology uh, in the late 2000s, starting in the late 2000s because very little was known about it. Um, very few nest sites had ever been found. Uh, uh, these birds are known to nest in um, remote mountainous areas along the coastlines of, coastline of Alaska, places that are kind of inaccessible. Um, but only a few nest sites had been located um, opportunistically in the past. And um, the Kilitz's Merlet, just for context, is uh, a close cousin of the Marbled Merlet, which I'm, I know a lot of people who are watching this presentation are probably more familiar with uh, because it's a species of local importance here in Washington and in the greater Northwest. Um, also a species that is prevalent in coastal Southeast and South Central Alaska. Um, they're, uh, they're congeners, but they look a little bit different as you can see from the picture in the lower left. Um, and in their breeding plumage as shown here, um, they, it relates a lot to the types of habitat they nest in. Uh, the Kitlitz's Merlet is known to nest on barren, rocky, not very vegetated slopes and you know, mountainous and steep areas. Uh, whereas the Marble Merlet, as you're probably aware, is um, associated with uh, nesting in 
old growth trees on the limbs of old growth trees um, in the Pacific Northwest. It also nests on the ground to some extent um, in Alaska, but uh, in general, the kind of colorations of these birds are a bit different and definitely help them blend in in their, in their nesting habitat during the summer breeding season. Um, so when I worked on the species, uh, Kitlitz's Merlets, it was in a place called Icy Bay, which is on, shown on the red star on the map there in uh, the um, central Gulf of Alaska. And um, I worked on a study there that specifically was using uh, telemetry and tracking to find nest sites of Kitlitz's Merlets in this dramatic landscape. Um, this is a bay that is a type uh, influenced by tidewater glaciers at its head and it sits at the foot of Mount St. Elias in the left picture. That's the big mountain in the background that um, has a peak at 18,000 feet above sea level. Um, and that's only about 11 miles from the, from the water, the ocean in this case. So it's a very steep and dramatic landscape. And so um, this project used, utilized uh, radio telemetry um, in which and involved capturing and tagging merlets on the water. Um, there's some examples of tagged birds on the lower right with um, radio antennas uh, on them. And we used a combination of uh, aerial telemetry, um, which uh, the picture on the right, upper right shows a antenna, a telemetry antenna mounted on the wing strut of a small aircraft. Um, so using telemetry from the air to locate um, birds when they're on land and also use, utilized ground telemetry by um, hiking in on the ground to areas um, with telemetry equipment to try to track down nest sites on the ground after they were located in the air. Uh, this was a project um, that was ongoing from 2007 to 2012 and was run by um, my colleague, Michelle Kissling, uh, and she provided a lot of the information that I'm gonna show tonight. She's at the University of Montana currently, and this was um, a project also run with the Fish and Wildlife Service at the time. So, um, so some of the, I'm just gonna go through some of the different places we found birds nesting um, as uh, here in a few slides. Um, uh, these, these pictures with yellow circles on them, these yellow circles are examples of places where birds were found nesting um, that were tagged and tracked with aerial telemetry. And in some cases, um, these first few examples I'm showing are somewhat similar to where people had found a few nests that were known about um, in the past, just opportunistically on foot. These are areas you could hike around. Um, uh, they're, you, they're accessible on foot by people, um, but on these kind of barren um, or sparsely vegetated rocky slopes in the mountains, um, fairly rugged, but, uh, um, uh, and a picture on the right shows a, a merlet, Kitlis is merlet chick on one of its nest sites. Um, and in this case, it's nesting on a, uh, a layer of gravel and talus that's sitting on top of a, directly on top of a glacier that's just ice like a foot below the rocks or the rocky surface on the, on, in this image. Um, but it was utilized multiple years in a row by the species. Um, and the important thing to, I forgot to mention earlier about merlets in general is that they're not a colonial um, nesting bird. Uh, most seabirds nest in colonies um, which in some ways makes them a lot easier to study than, um, than other types of birds and uh, because they're at least all in one place. Um, but merlets, um, these two kinds of merlets, uh, mar marble merlets and kitlets as merlets, they nest um, solitarily on their own um, in these remote and um, distant sites. So uh, more challenging to study, which is why telemetry really helped understand, helps understand better where they go to nest. So these, these two examples were more, more um, in line with what was known about, the little that was known about the species going into this study. But we also found nest sites in some very dramatic places. Um, this, uh, these pictures show um, Mount St. Elias, the mountain, mountain I mentioned earlier, that the peak of which is 18,000 feet above Icy Bay uh, in the ocean. Um, and the yellow circles are showing um, nest sites that were we couldn't access on the ground, but were found with aerial telemetry. Uh, and they're on um, in these dramatic locations on cliffs thousands of feet above the ocean and sometimes dozens of kilometers um, from the water um, below glaciers and surrounded by glaciers. 
And this was um, not something that had been documented before and turned out to be actually a fairly um, common type of location for the species to nest. So this was a really um, interesting finding and something I thought was incredibly impressive to just see a small little seabird like this going up to, to, to lay its one egg and on these amazing places um, where you just wouldn't, wouldn't think that they would go. Um, this map is just showing kind of geogra geographic spread of uh, murrelet nest sites around Icy Bay. Uh, the blue dots are Kitlitz's as murrelet nests and um, the colors on the map, the white is all basically glacier and snow and the brown is barren area or unvegetated areas and the green are you know, forested or shrub areas uh, on the landscape. And you can see that there's a fairly big spread of where the Kitlitz's as murrelet's nests were located. A lot of them are inland though in these what look like icy snowy areas and um, the red dots are marble murrelets. Uh, this project also studied marble murrelets as a comparison um, because these species are similar in very many ways. There was interest in understanding a little bit more about how they're different in this place. Um, and uh, another interesting finding in this study was that while mar mar marble murrelets nest where we are more familiar with them nesting in old growth trees and forests, um, like this photo on the left, um, they also were nesting in similar habitats to Kitlitz's as murrelets, um, such as steep cliffs surrounded by glaciers deep into the mountains. Um, so this was just really cool and interesting to see and um, kind of expanded our knowledge of where the species goes and you know, what sort of habitats it needs to nest and um, where it may be more or less at risk of say disturbance or have any you know, issues, uh, conservation issues related to its nesting habitat. Um, and one of the outcomes of some of this work was uh, uh, basically coming up with some, some, some map products that uh, depicts where there is potential nesting habitat um, throughout the rain, nesting range of um, Kitlitz's as murrelets. Uh, and that's what's shown in red on this map here on the slide. Um, based on some of the different habitat parameters that we observed in this study in Icy Bay, but also incorporating information from other sites uh, where the species has been studied. Uh, we were able to um, map out places where the species could be to help direct future research or, um, or focus any attention in areas um, where there could be any management or conservation concerns for, for nesting marlets. And um, with that, I'll pause again uh, and let's, Stephen, let me know if there's any questions. Yeah, I've got three questions here. Well, the first one, were all the, um, were all the um, sites that were discovered using the VHF in this example, even the first two that you showed where they thought they, they knew of other areas, or areas that were already had, already had nests, were they, was that, were they discovered by VHF as well? Um, the first, these two? Uh, yeah, those two, right, those two. These, these two um, were discovered by VHF. I, uh, I was just trying to highlight that they were in habitat that was similar to what was known because basically because these are area, this type of habitat is something that like a, a human being could actually go walk up on. Okay. And okay. opportunistically stumble upon a, a murrelet nest. Um, but which is, the, which is how we knew about most Kitlitz's murrelet nests leading up to studies like this one. Um, they were mostly opportunistically encountered by someone just happening upon it um, because you know, given how dispersed their nesting is and in these remote and rugged places, they're very challenging species to go actively search for. Or there are some studies that do that in certain areas, certain very isolated areas, um, but these two the examples. second question is like yeah. those um, sites that were really, I mean, well, the map you showed was really glaciated. Um, not this map, the next one. Um, were the marble were these all on like rocky areas within the within the snowpack area or? Yeah, it's it's hard to see on the map because some of those um, some of those areas where the nests are. Or just a cliff. So on a map, they don't really show up as very much. But um, essentially, they're 
None of them are actually nesting on the snow or on the ice. That's a good question. Um, they're nesting on some sort of rocky substrate, either um, probably like a ledge or something on a cliff or, or in the case of, um, or maybe on little patches of, uh, of um, gravel and cobble and, and, and talus, like in this image on the right here. Okay, okay. And how are, how are the, um, the murlets, how are they caught in the first place to be able to put the tags on them? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, murlets are challenging to, uh, challenging to work with for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons is catching them in the first place. Uh, the primary way that people catch these species of murlets, um, which are these, these species that are non-colonial, don't nest colonially, so there's no like one place you can go find them on land. Uh, the primary way to study them is to uh, catch them on the water at night in areas uh, where you know there probably will be. In this case, in this place, Icy Bay, this is a known constant high concentration area of this species um, at, on the water. So you go out at night in a small inflatable skiff and um, use, using spotlights and like big salmon dip nets, you actually cruise around until you see merlets in the spotlight and then try to sneak up on it and catch it in a net before it dives or flies away from you, which um, works sometimes, but not nearly as many times as you'd like, especially at three in the morning. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Okay, that, I think that was all the questions. Great. Okay. Um, well, now I'll switch gears to a new example. Um, uh, we'll get away from the cold, icy waters of uh, Alaska, which is um, probably not that appealing on a cold, windy, rainy night in northern Washington. And I'm going to talk about uh, tracking marine birds in Hawaii, um, and uh, which is very different in a variety of ways from the previous example. Um, and this example is going to be a bit in the context of um, marine spatial planning and potential wind energy development around the main Hawaiian Islands. Um, there are a few proposed um, offshore wind turbine sites that uh, are not approved or permitted in any way yet, but um, a few different private companies have um, proposed to develop these. So it's just something that's on the radar specifically here, but also um, all around the United States and coastal waters uh, as alternative energy um, development and use uh, ramps up in different places. And so um, there's a couple different specific um, ways in which birds can be vulnerable to wind energy development or wind turbines. Um, the first and obvious one is that most people think of as collision with turbines, birds directly impacting those structures. Um, the second is uh, birds being displaced from areas um, that where wind turbines are built. So the example on the lower right is a figure from an, uh, a really cool figure from a paper uh, using radar to track sea ducks in um, waters off Europe. And the red dots are uh, wind turbines and the black lines are all radar tracks of birds. And you can see birds are mostly avoiding the wind turbine area um, versus going through it, which could be a good thing in that of prevents any kind of collision issues, but um, could also be a bad thing if uh, that's an area that used to be important habitat to those species. So a couple different ways of thinking about potential impacts there and um, knowing where different species uh, need to go at sea to um, meet their needs is an important first step uh, uh, for trying to think about any kind of potential impacts for environmental impacts for wind energy development. Um, so this project uh, is a project that I've been actively working on with my position at USGS um, in which we studied a variety of species all throughout the main Hawaiian Islands. Um, different colors indicate different species and different colonies. Um, and we used GPS tracking in this case to tag birds at their nests. These are all birds that nest in colonies unlike, unlike the last example. So far more convenient for locating them and walking up to them and catching them. Um, and we use GPS tags to track these birds from their colonies to identify important areas at sea where these birds are foraging um, during their breeding season. So for where they're foraging to feed themselves and feed their young. Um, 
And this study was uh, active um, for four years from 2013 to 2016 and involved tagging hundreds of individuals across uh, five different species um, at um, over a dozen different colonies um, in the main Hawaiian islands. And uh, this uh, sort of horrendous, but sort of what I think sort of amazing map shows uh, all these lines or tracks of different individuals, different species from all these different colonies. And um, in the upper right, you can see um, birds ranging as far north um, as near Alaska um, from the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, and then in the main map, you can just see all these different individual trips. And all I wanted to, people to take away from this is there's a lot of different things going on with different individuals and different species and different colonies. And um, when we step back though and start digesting this information, there's a lot we can learn from it um, at a variety of levels. So first off, we can you know, consider different uh, strategies of different species when they go on foraging trips to feed their young. Um, for example, um, a laysan albatross, the bird kind of shown in the pinkish color here, um, is a species that will travel for weeks at a time and travel thousands and thousands of kilometers to travel as far north as Washington and Alaska on a single foraging trip to come back and feed its chick um, back on, at a nesting colony on Kauai. At the same site, um, uh, wedge-tailed shearwater shown in gray and red-tailed tropic birds in red will travel for say four or five days or a week and travel hundreds of kilometers to do the same thing. So a shorter trip, but still an impressive um, an impressive thing to go do to just go to the grocery store. Uh, and then um, another example would be red-footed boobies, which um, basically only go away for a single day and travel maybe only 100 kilometers from the colony and come back every night with a meal for their chick. So a variety of different strategies that we can learn about from studying these different species. Um, we can also learn a lot, we've also learned a lot about how individual species at different colonies you know, might differ in where they go to forage at sea and how that might relate to, say, these potential wind areas. In this example, red-tailed tropic birds uh, nesting at three different colonies, which are indicated by the different colors on the map. Uh, go, uh, they go, they were tracked going to very different places from one another and not overlapping a whole lot in where they go to forage at sea. Um, and, and specifically only the colony in red in the lower right had any sort of significant interaction or overlap with one of these potential wind energy areas. So it, we can learn a lot about individual species and just which colonies for those species could be um, of future concern or interest as it relates to researcher management um, concerning wind energy development. You can also learn really cool things about the behavior of these animals with these GPS tags, we're getting information on the minute to minute scale in a lot of cases. So very high resolution. And we can essentially based on how fast animals are moving and how they're turning or not turning, we can understand whether they're say uh, the locations we collect on the, on the tag are, are, um, are locations of birds transiting or just commuting um, to the grocery store to get to go forage for fish or if they're um, more actively searching or resting on the water surface or actually actively engaged in foraging um, because they're circling more or spending more time in a small area. So we can map out these sorts of behaviors um, for individuals uh, and in among species and across colonies to get a better picture of what might be more important or less important areas at sea. Um, so, um, so I'll, I'll pause again here um, and uh, if there's any questions before I go to the next example. Well, yeah, Jonathan, one of the questions we had is, um, is it difficult to distinguish individual birds? Are there ways to make sure you're distinguishing individual birds or do they have different, I mean, how, how does that work? Um, Individuals, uh, well, I think if, if you mean individuals like um, unique individuals at a colony site, um, so that right. we, I mean, do they, they, do they have an ind individual signal. Is that what's going? Oh, with these tags, individual. these GPS, these GPS tags are um, the ones we're using in this case are mostly I'll call them archival units. Um, sorry, there's a little bit of background noise right now, but it should be gone soon. Um, uh, 
they're archival units and they, uh, we put them out on a bird at a nest site and that bird is tied to that nest site. And that bird also gets a, a metal Fish and Wildlife Service metal, unique metal band on its leg. So we go back to the same site to recover that tag um, and take it off the bird after a week or two. Um, and then we know we're working with the same individual. Okay. Well, one, one, another question I have, just looking at the maps where the, the birds um, have gone, um, there, there are large areas where there's, where they don't go at all. Are these areas that are just um, too deep or there, there just isn't, aren't any fish there for the, there just aren't any fish in those areas? Or they're not, on the way, they're not on the way to some place where there are fish? Question. I, I think it, it's very, it really depends on the species and, and it also depends on the colony because um, in some cases they're, like you said, they're not on the way to where they want to go. Um, in many cases, you know, some of these birds are, that don't range very far, um, are, are, are basically trying to compete for resources um, on a small scale around a colony and then other species that range further like the red-tailed tropic bird in this example, um, they tend to venture fairly uh, a bit further away from the colony. Um, and so they're, they're looking to exploit resources that are further away from say competition near the colony from other species. So, um, but it, it really depends on, um, you know, what specific foraging strategies or resources those animals um, specific species and those uh, uh, utilize to feed themselves in their chicks and um, and where those are and uh, those the, where the where where the where their forage where their food is will depend on um, you know the depth of the water or other aspects of oceanography that's kind of the holy grail in seabird biology is trying to tie like where birds are to um, some habitat feature um, really, we'd love to have some layer knowledge of like where all the fish are that they eat, but we don't have that. We have these other things that we think could be related. So it, it gets kind of tricky to, to relate the two, but that's one of the main, uh, a big, a big thing that seabird researchers and marine, marine wildlife researchers work on pretty actively is trying to tie those two things together. Okay. We had another question about, um, it, it seems like the red, foot, the red footed boobies are nesting on the far westernmost island in the picture. Is there, a, um, can you give us any information on why they prefer that location? Um, maybe in this picture. Um, uh, the red-footed boobies uh, nest on Oahu, Kauai, and then on a site called um, Lehua, which is um, just west of Kauai here. Um, right, right, yeah. And they've also, they've also recently started nesting on Maui. Um, there's a small new colony there that's not shown on this uh, on this map, um, and that's a good question. And and I think it's one we often scratch our heads at um, working in this area because you know you look at the island of Hawaii and there's not many. Well, there's no, no none of these species are nesting on the main island of Hawaii for the most part, um, the Big Island. And it seems that the, the the diversity in numbers of species tend to increase further out into the island chain, and a lot of these species also nest. Um, further out into the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, the, the low-lying atolls uh, that you've probably heard of, like Turn Island or Midway Island, places like that. Um, but it, it seems like uh, it's not entirely clear to me why, if it, that is related to, you know, some sort of foraging habitat or oceanography, or it's actually like a nesting habitat, terrestrial habitat issue. Um, uh, a lot of these smaller islands might be more likely to have. Um, less issues with introduced predators, at least the smaller islets and rocks offshore of these islands. Um, but uh, it's a good question. And how do you, for, for these colony nesting birds, what is the main strategy for tagging those? The main strategy for uh, what? Could you say that again? Sorry. Putting, putting tags on, on these birds. These birds, um, as mentioned, are very crackers, are, they're incredibly easy to work with compared to the merlets in the prior example. Um, they didn't, they're most fairly, for, for these species that I'm showing here, they, they didn't adapt, um, they're not adapted to dealing with uh, predators really of any kind. And 
So they're not very afraid of humans. Um, so if you go to a nesting colony, you can essentially walk right up to a lot of these species um, and uh, pick them up without too much trouble. Um, and uh, there's a few examples where it's a little more challenging, but um, we can basically work in colonies fairly easily to, to capture individuals, mostly by hand, and, um, and then just hold them for a short period of time. And the tags we're working with in this example, the GPS tags, um, most of them are actually taped onto their either back or tail feathers with a kind of waterproof, flexible uh, tape that we then, um, that holds the tag on long enough for a few weeks. And then we recapture that bird a couple weeks later and take the tag back off and get the data off of it. So it's a shorter term deployment and um, easier, definitely easier to work with than uh, the marlets. Another question I had is if these, some of these birds are leaving for such a long period of time to forage for food to bring back to the, to the nesting site, how do they store that? How are they storing that food? Yeah. Uh, That's a great question. Um, I'll maybe go to this slide. Uh, it depends on the species. And um, for the examples of the lace, the lace and albatross and the wedge-tailed shearwater, which are both um, prosolarids or tube noses, they um, consume food and then convert it into a very rich fatty oil um, that they then regurgitate when they finally come back to their nest. Um, to their, they regurgitate that to their chick. On the other hand, um, uh, uh, the red-tailed tropic birds and red-footed boobies, they don't have the capacity to do that and they need to, they hold, they, they ultimately hold food in their, um, in their crop. Uh, they hold a whole prey item, like a whole fish, and they come back, or, or like a pile of fish, say they caught like a few at once or in a short succession, and then they come back and they regurgitate those whole fish to their chick. So they, um, for example, the, with the red-tailed tropic bird, that bird will go away for, you know, sometimes a week at a time, and um, it essentially comes, it probably feeds for itself along that trip, but then somewhere near the end, it catches a few fish that it, a fish or a few fish that it then feeds ultimately whole when it finally returns near the end of the trip to its chick. Okay. And then one, one last question. Is there any, the, the birds that are, or you mentioned that a colony just was, was becoming established on Maui. Is there, does that have anything to do with the, the, um, the fact that there, there's less sugar cane production now or, or no, no, no correlation at all? Uh, with the fact that, what was that? I'm sorry. That the sugar cane production is basically, you know, is oh. not, not occurring anymore. Not that I'm aware of, but I'm not, um, I'm not super in the know on that colony yet. It's a colleague of mine, colleagues of mine work on it on Maui, and, um, but I'm not, I'm not aware if it's a, there's a specific change in land management that um, allowed for that to develop, or um, if those birds just uh, recolonized or colonized that area on their own, and it just, maybe populations were expanding on the other Hawaiian islands, and they were just kind of moved over to start a new, new place for themselves. But I don't know specifically the answer to that. It's a good question. Okay, that's all the questions. Thanks. All right. Um, well, I'll go to my last example then, and I'm going to talk about uh, shearwater migration and um, what we've learned about that from tagging uh, shearwaters. So um, just first, I'm going to talk about a species I haven't really worked on myself, but um, maybe more relevant to folks in Washington, uh, the sooty shearwater. Um, this is a species that breeds primarily in New Zealand and in uh, on islands in New Zealand and in Chile, um, also to a lesser extent in the southern Atlantic, um, but I'll just focus on the Pacific Ocean for now. Uh, and this is a species that you can see um, along the coastlines of, of, along the west coast of the U.S. Um, you can see them from shore in some cases, um, and they number in the tens of millions of birds as far as their population goes globally. Um, so, you know, sites like this of these huge foraging flocks of city shore waters, this is a picture taken in um, California, but uh, I know this is something that can be seen uh, along the outer Washington coast occasionally as well. 
um, the species uh, migrates in large numbers um, to the northern hemisphere during its non-breeding period, which corresponds with our summer in the northern hemisphere. Um, and uh, um, another um, researcher, Scott Schaefer, worked tagged these birds at breeding colonies in New Zealand um, in the early 2000s to first try to understand, you know, we know these species, the species exists in the Northern Hemisphere, and, but breeds in the Southern Hemisphere, but like we don't really know much about the relative importance of these different areas or how it moves between them. And um, this map shows an example of um, tracks of, of, of birds after they finished breeding in New Zealand and how they traveled um, primarily up to waters off of Eastern Russia and Japan, and then also of Alaska, and then also along the west coast of uh, North America, Washington, down through Baja, California, and Mexico. So it's really dramatic um, trans-equatorial migration of, um, of, of this species, uh, basically capitalizing on um, what Scott called, you know, capitalizing on the endless summer. So you know, exploiting the seasonal productivity of the Southern Hemisphere um, during its summer months um, to breed and then um, and then uh, migrating to the northern hemisphere for our summer to um, also get on get in on the productivity of our oceans and in, uh, in, in our summer months. Um, and then another uh, another shearwater species that I've worked more directly on, the pink-footed shearwater, um, is uh, also uh, uh, an eastern. It's an eastern Pacific species. It it breeds only um, in a couple of islands in Chile. Its population is way smaller than the sooty shearwater numbering in the potentially tens of thousands compared to the tens of millions of the sooty shearwater. Uh, and um, this is a species similar to prior, similar to the sooty shearwater that prior to tracking there wasn't a lot of knowledge of you know relative distributions of the species or how it migrated between point A and point B. And um, so uh, all we kind of know or knew about this species was that it, it, it ranged from Chile up to uh, uh, southern Alaska uh, and seemed to be primarily constrained to the eastern Pacific along, along the west coasts of North and South America. So um, I worked on a project um, tagging this species for several years um, using uh, satellite telemetry on an island called Isla Mocha in southern Chile, which is one of two main breeding sites for the species. Um, we tag birds at their nest sites. They nest in burrows in these really cool deciduous forests uh, uh, on Isla Mocha up on the uplands where they crash through the trees at night, um, coming back to their colony, to their burrows to feed their chicks and crash to the ground and go into their burrow and feed their chick and then come back out and oftentimes climb trees uh, to then jump off the side of the hill, hill slope to fly back out to sea. Um, and uh, this study was um, used satellite telemetry to, to identify important migratory and non-breeding areas uh, at sea for this species from 2006 to 2015. Um, and uh, just showing a map of those tracks and uh, what we learned from that study, uh, we found some really specific important areas for this, for this species when it comes to the migration and wintering areas. Uh, uh, on the map, you can see in the, the lower, on the lower portion of the map, you can see in the box, their breeding area in, um, in central Chile. And these birds exploit um, one of two strategies during the non-breeding period after they, after they finish breeding. Um, they initially migrate um, somewhat rapidly to waters off the coast of Peru, um, where, some birds either spend the entire non-breeding period before returning to the breeding area, um, or some birds just stop over there for a period of say one to three weeks uh, before continuing on and, and, and doing a longer migration all the way up to the west coast of North America um, and uh, where they spend the rest of the non-breeding period before returning back to first Peru for a, again, another stopover and then ultimately returning to the breeding colony. So um, we found that these that individuals of this species uh, and they migrated very rapidly through these migration areas, these long distance areas further out at sea, specifically you know, in particular between Peru and North America. Um, they utilized a broad offshore area and moved really quickly. Um, but then they spent um, 
significant and intensive time in waters uh, off of Peru and then waters off of um, North America from basically Vancouver Island down to Baja California in Mexico. And uh, just to um, uh, make things interesting, I'm going to show a, a disorienting map on its side late in the presentation, which I'm, hopefully isn't too confusing, but this is uh, uh, another result of this study showing um, kind of hot spots of use along the west coast of North America. Um, the red areas are areas that um, were used very heavily by these pink footed shearwaters that were tagged in Chile. And what you can see on this is that there were these some very specific areas that were more important um, to attract individuals, such as waters from sort of the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca off northern Washington, south through the Columbia River to central Oregon, and then also um, from central California to southern California to the Channel Islands, and then a few more areas off of Baja California as well. Um, and and this, this study enabled us to better understand the relative importance of different areas for this species, both um, in Peru or in South America and North America. Um, versus just knowing that this, knowing that as a species they utilize that greater enormous range. Now we have a better idea of um, the important um, at sea areas during the non breeding period for this species. And we also saw um, Some other cool examples of um, Interesting twists of fate in the natural history world. This exempt this this track that you see uh, way offshore. This one red track. This was a bird. This is a great example of vagrancy. Um, this this bird got sucked into a hurricane and pulled um, over a thousand kilometers further offshore than any of the other um, individuals we tracked. And then not until this hurricane kind of dissipated and passed was it able to return back to the coastal area and finish its migration to North America. Um, and this work is actively being used to, to better understand um, uh, sort of implications for fisheries interactions um, for this species. Uh, Pink-footed shearwaters are often um, caught in, uh, incidentally caught in commercial fisheries uh, activities in mostly in South America, off Chile and Peru, um, and this helped sort of focus in on what are the hot spots of use of that area and where might they be more at risk for that sort of um, negative interaction uh, so people can focus on where they might want to work further on that issue. And, and again, I will pause. Well, I think I'll just say thank you. Um, I'm going to wrap up that example and uh, you know, say thank you for listening to me ramble about um, the cool things we can learn about seabirds from tracking them and then I'll um, uh, take any questions about any of the examples or anything else um, that anyone's interested in. Uh, I'll try to field those as best I can. So thank you for listening in. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I have a question and maybe some of our um, audience members also have questions at this point. If you can write them in the chat in the Q&A, that'd be great. Um, I know there's a pe person that raised their hand, but if you could write it in the chat quickly, it'd be um, or in the Q&A function would be better at this point. Um, one question I have is maybe, maybe you could, could, could you give a little more detail on like, um, say the pink shearwater, how you talked about it crashing through the trees and, and, into the, in, and then down into the burrows and climbing the trees. Can you talk a little more about sort of what's going, I mean, can you describe that a little bit more from your experience there? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I was curious about that the pink-footed shearwater and yeah, I mean, I, yeah. when you said that, it's like really hurt my interest. Yeah, it's really, what's really going on there? It's a really interesting place, um, and it's a pretty spectacular thing to experience. Um, and a lot of these shearwaters, a lot of shearwater species, nest in vegetated or in some in some cases forested areas in the southern hemisphere. Um, on islands in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, for the example of the pink-footed shearwater, um, they utilize habitat that provides burrowing and also safety from predators. And, and this is one of those places that provides that. And um, so uh, 
working on this colony to catch these birds is also um, like many seabird endeavors or like a lot of them is a nocturnal um, endeavor. So it involves spending the night awake, uh, trying not to fall asleep um, on some steep hillside somewhere in the woods. And um, it's a pretty magical experience to, as the sun sets and um, the world gets dark to suddenly hear shearwaters, think for the shearwaters calling and hear crashes in the leaves above you. And as these birds find their way in back um, to their, through the canopy and down to the forest floor to their, somewhere hopefully close to their burrow. Um, and one of the, my favorite memories of working there was, uh, um, I, I think I mentioned earlier that they would often climb trees to, um, or climb up to kind of angled trees to try to get some height and elevation before they launched back off. Um, into the air to go back out to sea. And my coworker um, was sitting against one of those trees one evening while we were waiting for a um, bird to come back to its burrow to tag it. And uh, one shearwater just, because they're actually fairly calm around humans, it literally just crawled up the tree and right over his face and then kept going up the tree and just didn't really even care that he was there. Um, so uh, huh. it's, pretty, it's pretty strange and amazing experience uh, and so they're otherworldly I would say. So so you in this in this situation you you go out and find the burrows first and then you yeah this involved identifying active burrows that had chicks in them and then these birds are gone at sea for usually several days to maybe a week or more um, on, on foraging trips. We'd go at the end of the breeding season while there were still birds feeding chicks, but right before they were basically done and the, right before the chick was going to fledge. And we would monitor these burrows every night waiting for an adult to come back to feed the chick and we'd let it feed its chick and then we'd catch it on its way back out of the burrow and put the tag on it um, and then let it go. Wow. And so it involves working at a time when most birds are gone from the colony though. So it's, it's, it's a bit, it's a lot of waiting in the dark. How do you entertain yourself then? Um, when you're waiting in the dark, you tell <laughs> well, you, you, lean, you, lean against, you lean against trees and hope that a sure water will crawl over your face. That's the main um, way. Yeah. Um, one of the questions, um, one of the uh, participants has is, is anyone researching the physiology of the birds to understand how the, their incredible nonstop flights, you know, turn, like for example, turns flying from multiple days from north to, northern to the southern hemisphere? Yeah, and, um, that's a great question. And uh, I am not working with anyone actively. There are people who work on that, those sorts of questions, like energetics and physiology type questions. Um, I'm, I'm not involved with any work on that subject. Uh, I'm mostly just amazed at it, like most other people. Um, and yeah, often it's something I, I think I often take for granted. Um, I just see that they can do it and just assume that they can do it because they can. Um, but the actual physiology and, the, and what, what, uh, what allows these animals to, to pull off what to us seem like just impossible feats uh, is pretty astounding and um, I wish I knew more about it. Well, one question we have is the, the one bird that was detoured in a hurricane, could, mm -hmm. can you tell by the tracking whether it actually stopped to rest on the water or it, how, did it rest or did it just keep flying the whole time? And then, I, then I, I'm curious about why, why it didn't fly directly you know, to North America, you know, why did it fly all the way back the way it came instead of flying directly to the West Coast? That's a good question. I, um, the satellite tracking data is a little trickier to work with when it comes to trying to identify specific behaviors, like did a bird rest on the water or did it, was it flying? Um, it often comes in, at not very regular intervals. So instead of like the GPS, we get a location every two minutes or, or five minutes or whatever we program it to, it tends to just do what we, you tell it. Um, the, the satellite tracking work, um, those tags, you might get a location right now and then maybe one in 20 minutes and then it might be six hours before you get another one. So it's a little hard to figure out what exactly an animal's doing. Um, 
So I don't know specifically with that in that case if that if that bird say landed on the water for a period of time, um, but in general, I think that it uh, from what I remember of looking at that track, it looked like it was it didn't there wasn't anything obvious about it just sitting there. It was definitely seemed like it was flying or at least somewhat on the go. But um, and then your other question related to how did it why did it go back? essentially the same way before returning to its north to its north northerly trajectory um that's also a great question and i don't know if that has to do with just how that bird navigates um or if you know you know potentially maybe it didn't know how maybe it didn't know how to get you know cut off the distance from uh way offshore where it was to where it had originally been trying to go which is baja maybe it had to like navigate back to a place it knows and by knows i mean you could take that as meaning has some memory or knowledge of, or has some other kind of awareness or, or surrounding it. Like a lot of shearwaters, one example of how shearwaters navigate involves just that they use light levels. Um, they know how far east or west they are, north or south, based on kind of their relative internal clock and how that relates to the light levels, both in terms of sunrise and sunset times and day length around them. So it could be that it just dis was disoriented um, in that regard and, and had to get back to a, get itself back on track. But that's all kind of conjecture. So I don't really know. Right. Yeah. So we have a number of questions about the burrows. Um, mm -hmm. How are these created in the root structures of the trees? Um, what types of trees are they digging or building these burrows or are they Right in, are they right in the tree roots? Are they digging their own? Are they digging their own burrows, or using burrows that were already formed? Also, how do they find these burrows in the dark? I mean, they have some way of seeing them in the dark. Right. Or, yeah. Um, yeah. They they dig the burrows themselves. Um, they have uh, very sharp, very sharp claws on the tips of their on their on their on their tips of their feet and they are really good at digging with those they're also really good at ripping skin open on your fingers while you're handling them um and making you bleed uh but they, they dig the burrows themselves they tend to utilize habitat that's um hat is a little more steeply sloping and has some more exposed roots because I think it, it gives a little more structure within which they can then burrow into the side of a slope um, the, the, and the roots help give that structure or maintain the integrity of a burrow that they dig versus if it was just in like a pile of sand it would fall apart really easily so I think that's a little bit on the kind of burrow part and then um, and they might also utilize partially um, or, or alcoves or openings that are part, partially natural, but then work within those. So like say like, say there's erosion and there's like a overhanging, some overhanging roots, they might preferentially choose to burrow under, in underneath that because it already has, gives them a head start at getting kind of underground and deeper into the, under the surface. And then um, uh, I think, I don't actually know exactly how they find their burrow at night, um, but I assume that a combination of sight and smell are able or and, and some form of memory are what they're able to pinpoint an area that they know where their burrow is and then they can hone in on it once they land on the ground because when you're in the forest you you at night you you can watch a bird land um and walk five feet and go right into its burrow like they seem to know where to hit the forest canopy on the island and then when they fall they're pretty close and then they walk in. That's not to say they don't also land in the wrong place other times, but I haven't watched that many birds do that. Um, so. And what kind of trees, what kind of trees are there? Do they, do they specifically look for certain, certain tree roots or are there, is there certain tree species? Um, they don't seem to have a preference for any specific tree species here. These are all um, a variety of deciduous and evergreen deciduous um, trees that are native to, southern, to South America and to this area in Chile and um, but they seem to utilize area of they don't seem to utilize any specific tree species. Um, I should also say that on the other island 
the other main breeding site for this species, which is um, north of Isla Mocha in the Juan Fernandez archipelago, which is there's two small islands there where this species breeds. Um, they nest in non-forested habitat, so it's just more rocky and shrubby slopes that they um, burrow into and nest in. So they don't only use these forests, but this and this is, you know, specific to this site. Okay, but then I have two questions going back to the the Hawaii Hawaiian example. Okay. Um, how do how do the young birds survive for so long? without food and are both males and females helping feed these birds that um, yeah, yeah. Have these, these different birds in these colonies? Um, uh, overall for a lot of these um, these tropical species that uh, a lot of these tropical species have very long breeding periods and uh, I think that's partly related to the fact that um, there are, you know, they're adapted to a world that it isn't like, say, the coast of Washington or in Alaska, where you have a very short but very productive summer season, um, both in the ocean and on land, depending upon if you're talking about marine or terrestrial animals. In the tropics, things are a little more evened out and kind of less, less, less boom and bust, I guess, seasonally. So these, a lot of these species have very long breeding periods um, that take months and months and months instead of, uh, they take, you know, three, four or five, six months um, to between laying an egg and fledging a chick. Um, wow. And most of that is, is, is um, tied up in the chick rearing part of the, of the breeding cycle. And so, um, as species, they're just, well, they kind of easy get answer I'll try to get away with is that they're just adapted to that. That's the, that's the world in which they evolved and they have made it work. But more specifically, um, uh, because of that, because they're adapted to having this slow chick growth and slow um, chick rearing period, uh, yeah, these bird, the chicks, um, assuming that they're in a place that's predator free, which is a big issue on islands and the tropics and everywhere, but um, assuming they're an issue doesn't have, in a place that doesn't have introduced predators like rats or cats, um, which would be a, a really serious threat because there's no parent there defending the chick. Um, and often off, in most cases, these birds couldn't do much to defend a chick against something like a cat anyways. But um, assuming there's no predators, uh, they, the chicks just grow really slowly. So they're adapted to um, not being fed very often. And um, as opposed to the merlet, which the merlet example, um, they, those, those merlets reach um, near adult size and fledging, and fledging age um, in less than, just under a month. Um, and in this case, for, like a, for some of these species like wedge-tailed shearwater, for example, they take three plus months to, to from chick hatching um, to the point when a chick might fledge. Um, so they're just adapted to grow, grow slowly and be fed less um, and over a longer period of time. Are both the males and females feeding? Oh, them? yes. And, and in all these cases, um, both the males and females are involved with incubating the eggs and, and feeding the chicks. Um, there tends, with some species, and, and I think in these, there's some examples of that with some of the species in Hawaii that we worked with. Um, they often the female takes a little bit more of a break after um, at the end of incubation potentially like when chicks first hatch the female might spend a little more extra time at sea see feeding herself and regaining strength and mass um, but ultimately um, males and females um, both participate in uh, most aspects of incubation and chick rearing and feeding. Okay, um, then I've got, there's just one other question here so far, unless other, other people have questions. And that is, um, um, in Hawaii with these wind farms, is there, is there a lot of opposition to these wind far farms and are people sort of in opposition to them or what, what is going on with those? Sure. And, and are there groups, are groups that are actively trying to stop them? 
I would say it's probably not even at that stage yet from what I understand. Um, I mean, they're on people's radars, but because they're, from what I understand, they're more hung up. Um, you know, there's been these proposals put in by some companies to build them, um, but the agency that permits that, the, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, they're, they are in charge of leasing and permitting any federal waters. They're kind of like the BLM of, or the Forest Service of the, of the, of the ocean federal waters further than three miles offshore. They're in charge of any sort of um, decisions, decisions that would be made on permitting these, these developments. And, um, you know, I think, I think they're still way, way, way earlier in the process than um, dealing with specific opposition on single, like just single issues like birds. Um, I mean, there's a lot of other stuff that goes into deciding whether or not to build these things. Like the Department of the, 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 Department of the Defense has to say like, yeah, we don't need those waters for anything else. Um, they need to deal with potential um, problems with say shipping lanes. Um, there's just like a whole spectrum of um, things that are balanced when deciding where to propose these things, where to permit them and that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm speaking of this, about this from you know, a place of, like, I don't actively work on that part of the process. We just provide environmental data to help guide that process. So, um, but I guess that what I would say that is that I don't know that there's specifically any groups that are actively fighting for or against those um, potential developments currently, I think partly, but I think partly because it's still pretty unclear if they're actually having a reality or not. And if so, how soon that would even be. Okay. Compared to the East, like in the East Coast, and there's a lot more engagement on wind, offshore wind um, and birds because there are offshore wind developments on the East Coast and a lot more proposed. Right. Okay, well, Jonathan, thank you so much for presenting tonight. Um, I really, found it informative and uh, I really appreciate you joining us and you know availing your availing um, us with your time and and I, I also want to thank all thank all the audience for coming and taking part in the presentation as well. So we hope to see you again. We hope to see you again um, the fourth Tuesday of January. And thank you again for joining us. Good night, everybody. Thanks a lot, everyone. Okay. Thank you.